I will now call the meeting of the Public Works and Safety, uh, Public Works and Safety Standing Committee to order. We want to welcome everyone to this uh, meeting. Looks like we've got a nice sized crowd tonight. Public comment is welcome. Anyone wishing to speak on the item that you're here for? <laughs> you will have two minutes to state your comments. You will please come forward to the table and you will be recognized for accurate recording purposes. We ask all present to speak directly in the microphone. Roll call. Roll call, Brian. Here. Brooks. Here. 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 Walker. Here. Okay. Here. <clears throat> Next, uh, we have the minutes for our September 15th meeting. Is there a motion for approval? So moved. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Ayes have it. Item one, number one takes us to our committee agenda consisting of resolutions calling for a survey of land for various improvements and projects. I turn it over to Bill Heatherman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is a fairly routine item associated with all large capital projects, among other things. It acknowledges the project and gives us authority to move forward with surveys, knowing that property will be acquired. You're used to seeing these periodically through the year in discussions with law. We decided that since the financing had gone through with these projects last month, that it really made forward just to bring these forward as a batch. And I can stand for any questions that you may have. Are there any? Second. Roll call. Roll call. Brian? Aye. Aye. Markley? Aye. Mattis? Aye. Walker? Aye. Okay. Aye. Item number two, call point connector trail, Bill Heatherman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have Frank Weatherford with Trans Systems uh, with me today. They're the engineer for this project. And if you give me just a second, I'm trying to open the, uh, the uh, slide here. Um, as many of you know, we have uh, been working on a connection from downtown to Caw Point Park. We have a federal KDOT grant uh, to cover the cost, and we went to bids this last October. For those of you that recall the project, we had envisioned um, uh, coming off of the current trailhead, uh, coming up by the EPA uh, field office, adjusting the the uh, Jersey barriers on the ramp of the Fairfax, Minnesota viaduct, and then a freestanding ramp that would take you basically uh, uh, semicircular down underneath the existing bridge over the flood wall and into the park. Uh, we opened bids in October, and due to the difficult working conditions under our bridge, uh, the existing bridge and, and uh, other surprises, we were way off budget, so much so that we had to advise KDOT to reject the bids and that we'd begin working on an alternative. And the biggest surprise for us was this ramp underneath the bridge. A uh, combination of the foundation uh, conditions, working underneath that bridge, and just general cost increases since uh, we did the initial estimate. We have, over the last 30 days, been looking at an alternative. And if you could open the other uh, design file. Uh, we think we have come up with an option that preserves much of what we had originally planned. And if you see on this uh, overall exhibit, if I can get the pointer, this is the EPA um, lab building. This is the intersection uh, with Minnesota Avenue. This is the viaduct that comes across. All that part in green is what we originally designed. This is where that ramp would have originally been. We're proposing simply to continue to the north, extend the Jersey barrier protections into the traffic lane, and provide an on-grade crossing so pedestrians can cross, cross the one lane of traffic that leads to the on-ramp to I-70. From that point, we would actually just stay on the ground and come around the little hill slope, come underneath the bridge on the ground. Uh, we've been talking with the Bartlett Grain uh, elevator folks. We have a meeting scheduled. We've been covering this question with a number of other the people that have a say-so in all of this. We think this alternate design would work and would eliminate the most expensive particular item. We just bring this to your attention tonight because this has been an important project. Uh, we put a lot of effort into it. I know that you all have had interest in it. 
and we wanted to share with you uh, both the difficulty we ran into and the solutions that we're coming up with. Uh, ask for any questions, and then if, um, if you wish uh, to give us comment or endorsement as we move forward, we hope to be able to rebid this in the spring. Any questions? I'd entertain a motion. Move to move forward with the, in the manner in which he's requesting. Is there a second? Second. Roll call, please. Roll call. Brian? Aye. Bill Brooks? Aye. Mark Lee? Aye. Maddox? Aye. Walker? All right. Okay. Aye. Item number three, and I'm going to turn it over to Jenny Myers, and at the same time, I will let Commissioner Jane Philbrick run a portion of this. Uh, before we get started, though, I would like to share just a little bit of information. Uh, we had approximately 36 emails for mostly the pit bull uh, ban, yeah. and then the other, there was five against, but only one of those was local. So, Jenny? Thank you. Uh, I'm Jenny Myers, Assistant <coughs> Counsel with the Unified Government. Um, I'm here with Katie Barnett, and we are here um, to present the proposed changes to the Animal Code. Um, all the proposed changes were sent to you with the red line version of the ordinances um, and were included in your packet. I'm going to turn it over to Katie Barnett to give you a little bit of history of how we got here and um, how we formed this Animal Committee and, and the proposed changes that we made. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Um, we were here in March of 2014. You all heard some of the concerns um, and you're presented with some proposed changes which uh, this committee formed the Animal Oversight Committee to study those changes, the proposed changes, um, and to try and address the concerns of uh, the residents. Um, so the goal is a uh, safer, more humane Kansas City, Kansas in Wyandotte County. <coughs> Um, before you tonight, you have the proposed ordinance changes uh, drafted by the Animal Oversight Committee. This is the first step um, in the entire animal control initiative. What we decided was that um, we needed, the, the committee decided that we needed training for animal control. We needed policy and budget changes at animal control. And we also needed to consider public education as part of this package uh, to achieve a safer, more humane Kansas City. Here are a few of the stakeholders. I know you guys have seen this list before, but this is just a reminder of everybody who's been involved in this um, since the summer of 2013, <coughs> basically. Um, livable neighborhoods, animal control, the police department, health department, healthy communities, Wyandotte, the Humane Society of Greater Kansas City, the legal department, um, and the municipal prosecutor. We also had people come to visit the oversight committee from Public Works, the rental and licensing division. Um, the county administrator's office, and we had a representative from Mayor Holland's office. Again, the idea is proposed ordinance changes, which you all are considering tonight, and that's the first step. We also discussed uh, policy changes, as I've said, training for animal control officers. Um, we need to consider the budget for animal control, the staffing concerns that we brought up last time, as animal control is highly understaffed for a city this size. Um, according to national recommendations by the National Animal Control Association, and um, instituting some online licensing and fee payments to ease the process and generate a little bit more revenue for the city. Um, again, public education, Healthy Communities Wyandotte has been working on grants. Um, a lot of these next steps that you've, you see here are somewhat dependent on the ordinance proposal being passed through your committee and going on to the Board of Commissioners. Once the ordinance changes are passed, we can start instituting the rest of these changes. Um, and then community outreach by the Humane Society of Greater Kansas City and Unleashed Pet Rescue. And um, again, education in schools and community centers on dog safety. Uh, this is just a reminder that there was a high dissatisfaction with animal control in general. That's kind of why we got to where we are today. Um, and the uh, stakeholder concerns that were addressed both in the community survey and um, in my meetings and in our animal oversight committee um, are listed there and you see them incorporated in the proposed changes. Um, finally, we just want to um, say that there are measurable results to these changes. This isn't just a one and done, let's pass this ordinance and hope everything goes okay. 
we need to continue to measure the, the income, the money that's coming in, and the time and the resources that are being spent, um, and also study the increased licensing and, and see really what we've done and it, if it's effective. Uh, again, should the proposed changes pass, um, I'm requesting that the Oversight Committee continues to meet to continue to work on what we've been discussing, including animal control uh, training, um, policy changes at animal control, and humane education for the community. Um, also, we had some changes in Article 5, which was a large animal ordinance. Uh, those changes, we decided, were best studied by a different committee comprised of some different stakeholders since they do involve livestock. And um, so tonight, I just, we're here to answer any questions you have. We've been working on this for over a year and a half, so we're absolutely open to questions. Um, and uh, if this passes, again, it's just the first step, so. So basically, we're talking about cats and dogs right now, not any other animals. Companion animals. And, and companion animals, okay. Which limits to a very few. So, yeah, so we're not talking about rabbits and chickens and, and uh, horses and pigs and any of that right now. We're just cats and dogs right now. <laughs> Would you like to present anything? Um, the, most of the changes, um, there are a lot of the proposed changes in here. Some of them are um, just cleaning up the ordinances, um, not really significant changes. Um, but I think the, um, the trap, neuter, and release is one of the um, significant changes. If anyone has questions to what that is or what we intend to do with that or any of the proposed changes, we'd be happy to address those. I would like for our committee to ask some questions here. Are, are we talking about, explain the, the trap, neuter, and that part of it. Okay, and I'm going to let Katie do that. Sure. Um, Currently, the city, if someone has a complaint about a cat, the city will go and pick up an outdoor cat. Um, the cat could be just an outdoor family cat and be owned by someone, or it could be part of a cat colony. Um, a few livable neighborhoods, neighborhoods have been trapping, neutering, and returning those cats to their colony to reduce the community cat population. Um, and that's something that's proven to work um, not only in that small livable neighborhood's neighborhood, um, but also in several different cities nationwide. And the goal, again, is to reduce the community cats, people, cats that don't belong to anyone, cats that are feral, cats that are unsocialized to people and cannot be um, adopted out should they be seized and founded. Go ahead, Jen. All right, within reasonable budget, considerations, would this be easier to enforce than the current regulations? This ordinance as a whole or the trap, neuter, return? The ordinance as a whole, all the changes that are asked for. Yes, and there's also no budgetary impact whatsoever with this ordinance change. The policy changes and staffing changes would come later and those might have a budgetary impact, but this does not expend any taxpayer dollars. And the second one, would, would this ultimately reduce the number of stray animals in Kansas City? That's Kansas. the goal, yes. I have just a couple of questions, and some I think were kind of answered up here, but I just want to sort of bring them up because I had questions about them. A lot of people who emailed asked about um, online fee payments, and it looks like that's not part of an ordinance change, but it's part of your future plans. Is that correct? That's correct. And I think that would be fabulous, personally, um, but I, I just wanted to make sure everybody understood that that was in the future plans. Um, just wasn't an ordinance change. Another question that someone asked me was, and, and you kind of just addressed this, but they asked, are we going to pay to trap, neuter, and return cats and I said I think it's more that it would be legal for other people to do that not that we're going to spend money on it is that the case also that's correct that would not be run by animal control whatsoever it would be run by private nonprofits um, that, are, that would do the trap neuter and return and then the last question that I had um, repeatedly was about was really about what, what we're calling nuisance dogs under this new draft talk a little bit about the change to having a nuisance dogs policy language in there versus um, versus how we've been doing in the past. Breed well, and not even just the breed specific, but I mean, people talk about the barking dogs and how do they deal with that and those sorts of things. So just talk a little bit about what that language means and how it applies, just sort of summarize for me. Sure, I think that's a really great question because I'm sure that that's the highest number of complaints that um, animal control receives. 
and um, the Nuisance Animals incorporate several uh, ordinance violations that were kind of scattered throughout and, and put them all together. So barking dogs, um, and it's, the proposed section is section 7-215, um, excessive noise, um, property damage by an animal, an animal constantly running at large, um, and an animal putting a person in fear. And a lot of those changes, and also animal injury, animal on animal violence. Um, so animal injury, that's also included in there. That This just gives your nuisance animal ordinance some teeth. It says, you know, you are a habitual violator. If you have a barking dog more than three times, then your dog will be labeled a nuisance animal um, and will be regulated as, regulated as such. Um, and the violations are, are in here, which means they'll pay a higher fine for each individual nuisance claim. Um, it, it penalties increase. The label of a nuisance animal requires that the animal is kept under control and um, in public that it's muzzled. And that's, that's also something that we have been considering. Those animals that have not bitten, a lot of people say, you know, there's always a one free bite rule. That means, you know, the animal gets to bite someone and then you know if, if it's dangerous or not. And, and we're trying to preempt that with this nuisance animal language. We're saying we in the, the veterinary community and animal trainers and behaviorists know best what kind of behaviors animals exhibit before they come before they become dangerous or when they're being neglected or not cared for and not supervised adequately and that's what this nuisance animal change does it is a it's kind of preemptive it addresses those changes before something really bad happens you want to say something about that go ahead and talk about dangerous and vicious you might as well sure um i i know most of you the single vector issue that people have been speaking about is the repealing the breed specific language and instituting uh, dangerous animals and vicious animals um, that those changes make what, what currently was in your ordinance was a non-family bite violation it was pretty vague and it was if an animal bit someone um, then it was subject to uh, keeping regulations like restraint well now if an animal bites someone but does not cause serious harm um, the the person must keep the animal according to and you see here a list um, and this found guilty of course all of this is goes through due, due process and everyone gets their day in court if they choose um, leash and muzzle um, appropriate confinement insurance um, muzzling identification with animal control these dogs or these animals are registered with animal control so they can keep an eye on people who have these kind of dogs who have bitten someone or killed another domestic animal dog or cat um, and then also under vicious animal that's an, an animal that's caused serious bodily harm to someone and um, or has serious bodily harm or death and so that those animals would be euthanized or removed from the city. I mean, there's just no tolerance for that kind of behavior out of animals these days. So, okay, Jenny, I was. In, is this three different things we're talking about, or are we lumping this all together? This is t tonight. It's um, we're addressing all of the proposed changes that are in here. So, and it's one of the pr pr proposed changes. I believe it is is to raise the, the amount of animals at each person, and, and it, it's what, it's two now, right? Yes, the maximum number, which is under 7-212, is the maximum number, <clears throat> and um, the Animal Control Oversight Committee has recommended taking it from two dogs um, or four cats to three dogs or three cats. So there, there is an increase in the maximum number. Okay, and then if, if we vote on this, we can, change some stuff that we do and we don't like as we're voting, correct? So, I mean, so I we, can, we can do any kind of amendment we right, want to, right. but I'm going to suggest that we actually listen to what everybody has to say before well, we do There's that. no motion yet. I have the right to ask questions. I'm no, no, ask questions. I'm just asking. I'm just yeah. making a statement because there's a lot of time spent by a lot of people put a lot of effort into this with a lot of knowledge and you know, I think that it's we have a tendency sometimes to 
not listen to, to all of those recommendations. And I'd like to see that we do that first before we make comment. That's I all. got a question. Okay. To Mr. Chairman. In reading this, and I'm trying to recall, I couldn't find the connection. Um, a bite injury, dog comes up and bites me. That's only a, that's only considered a dangerous a dangerous dog unless there's some kind of disfigurement or great bodily injury or death. Of course, that's going to leave open what constitutes great <coughs> bodily injury because that does not appear to be defined with any you know well, meaning. But my point is, on one of these, it's it, and I th I think it's down here on seven. 65 is that right it says if I'm on the real property of the owner or the keeper of the animal and I get bit that's not considered a dangerous animal I, I don't like that provision you know you unless a property is posted no trespassing or do not enter uh, there's no prohibition on an on a citizen to walk up your sidewalk and knock on your front door, or perhaps you're delivering something that you've ordered. And if I'm reading this right, if your dog bites me, then he's not a dangerous dog. He does get a free bite. Those those animals uh, would not be considered dangerous under the city code, but that wouldn't s prevent that person from filing an insurance claim or any kind of civil claim against that person. It was just what the city is going to label that animal. So what happens to the person that has a dog at, at, at large, presumably, in his front yard, you go up to the door and you get bit? You, we have no recourse through the criminal court or through any enforcement action under this ordinance? Well, I don't know that that animal would be considered at large since it's on the property of the owner. Well, I'm, I'm troubled by that. Okay mailman walks on your property every day and if he gets bit by a dog there's no recourse for him other than through the civil courts which of course is not going to happen what they'll do is stop delivering your mail probably uh, with the dog I don't I don't I think that's an that's a problem I don't think you get a free bite if we change that to um, if you'll look on the vicious animal section where it leaves an exception um, while the person is committing a criminal offense is that a little bit tighter of an exception whereas your regular invitees or your um, mailmen or utility people coming up to the home who aren't committing a crime or just a visitor somebody that uh, uh, you know, your prop, most people don't have fences around their front yards with signs that says no trespassing. So some kid's coming over to visit your kid and gets bit. This says, notwithstanding the definition of dangerous animal above, no animal may be declared dangerous if any injury or damage is sustained by a person or animal at such time as that person was was on the real property of the owner or keeper of the animal. I mean, I, well, I think we're open to changing that to I something think that a I, little bit. I think that has to be a little tighter than that because. How about a, someone committing a criminal? The whole trade-off here in this ordinance, and, and I, to be clear, I'm very supportive of it. Is we're we're taking the focus off the dog and putting responsibility on the owner, and. In this particular case, the way this reads, the owner's not responsible if the dog bites anybody. Uh, you know, even if it's just a, a small bite or, you know, a, I mean, come on. The owner has to bear the responsibility. I, it's not a big deal. It has nothing to do with the big issue on the plate in this particular ordinance. But uh, I don't think the animal being on the owner's property you, if you're going to let your dog out and your dog bites somebody, then you got you got to you got to pay the price for it. Okay, so um, I think that we would consider changing it to if someone's committing a criminal offense. Um, the converse of that situation is where 
your animal is lawfully in your front yard or backyard and someone, a child, trespasses because they think the dog is cute or something and then uh, the animal bites, well, it's not necessarily your dog's, it's not necessarily the dog's fault that the child wandered onto the property. So we just need to think of that situation and I think that's sort of what we were thinking in addition to the current language on non-family bite violations. Sorry. Well, and I would, I would ask that you also consider the idea that utility personnel coming to the home to notify that they're gonna be working and that they need the animal put up. Mm -hmm. They have to get to the door to be able to make the notification. Mm -hmm. so. yeah, I think I think we would be fine with changing it to mirror what the exception is for a vicious animal, which is someone committing a criminal offense on your property. Would that be agreeable? Yeah, I, I think so. I think they, I mean, what? the way I'm reading this, and again, there's a lot of changes in this thing, and I, I, maybe I haven't connected it all correctly together, but as long as he's doing it on his own property, uh, he's not a dangerous animal. How many, <clears throat> how many times do, uh, does an animal get away with a small bite bef before he becomes a vicious animal? Right. Do you have any number? I mean, what if this animal strikes, you know, uh, goes after the mailman every day? I use the mailman because I can't think of anybody else that's routinely on your property. But um, <clears throat> there ought to be at s some point at which a dog that has bitten someone that is uh, on the property it becomes uh, dangerous or vicious, even if there is no great bodily disfigurement. The dog has a propensity to bite people. A small dog may not be able to do as much damage as some of the larger breeds, but uh, still, you don't get free bites just because you're on your own property. We have to have a way to enforce that. Okay. And there are dogs that will chase people every time they come on the property. Um, can, I, can I ask you a question real quick? Uh, so how would you like to see them present that uh, she made a couple of suggestions and well I mean certainly uh, not committing a criminal act and it's not trespass again just because you walk on somebody's property so you you can can she make a suggestion and see if you agree with it with the change yeah she okay did, she did make did you change. agree with that Change? Well, I don't think that gets it all, gets all of it. It's better. What, what think, else do I you want to see? I think you've got to have a, a number of bites not resulting in disfigurement that converts that dog then into a vicious dog subject to vicious dog penalties. In other yes. words, we are getting back to the one bite rule. Oh, okay. Yeah. So um, if you look. Essentially, failure to comply. If your animal has been has bit someone and been declared a dangerous animal, it is subject to all of those restrictions. If the animal bites again or is out, um, if it is not microchipped, all of those, all of the, the list of penalties. If the animal uh, failure to comply um, is a separate offense, um, and then. It's subject to immediate seizure and, and impoundment. Um, and then also upon conviction, the court shall order the revocation of the license of such animal and the immediate removal of the animal from the city. So basically you wrap in the vicious animal penalty, which is euthanasia or removal from the city into if someone does have an animal that's bitten someone, been a deemed dangerous animal and is not complying with <coughs> those provisions. Okay. So, so well, there's one I'm, bite. Again, I'll, I'll made my my observation. I'll. It's a lot to try to wrap together. I know you guys have worked hard on it, so uh, it's got to come up again in front of the full commission. Right. Well, I'm gonna su I'm gonna suggest that we beat it to death before we even bother bringing it to the full commission. Because I think we should have it right before we bring it for the full commission. Would uh, Commissioner, Maddox. Commissioner Maddox, please. 
Thank you. Um, I wanted to know a little more about the trap, neuter, and release. Can you help me to understand what that, what that looks like? I can sure try. Huh? I can try. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So um, if someone, I'll give you an example. If someone has some cats on their property that they don't own but has become a colony of cats, um, they're feral. It's not like she can touch them or take them to the vet. Um, those aren't her cats. They just seem to be in her area traditionally because she may have left some food out or something. Um, currently, the animal control will go and seize them and impound those cats. They really can't do anything about that um, because the animals aren't social to anyone. So they'll impound them and likely euthanize them. The problem with that is if you have, say, a colony of seven cats and you seize five of them, you've opened up the colony for more cats to join. And so once you seize and impound and euthanize those cats, more cats join the colony. It keeps the colony open for adding more cats. It's, it's a very unique issue um, that I've learned about in the last few years. So effectively, seizing and impounding those cats actually doesn't reduce the community cat population at all. It actually keeps it growing. Um, so to, if you trap them, neuter them, and return them, you stop the animal from reproducing. Um, you keep the colony close to seven cats until they all die off. And then you get rid of some of that nuisance behavior and you have vaccinated cats in your community. Okay, and thank you. And I'll do some more research on that. It's very interesting. Yeah, because I tried to, I, I couldn't understand it. There was so much different information on it. I kind of got lost in it. Uh, and then one more question. Um, I know one of the proposed um, things coming forward in this ordinance is to maybe increase the amount of animals that one owner can have, but I'd like to know um, what is being done now by animal control um, to enhance uh, the way we attack this issue that we have with stray animals already. So the fact that we want to allow people to have more animals, what are we doing now because they're uh, it's a large number of uh, stray animals that are already roaming the community. I'm not sure that increasing the maximum is the same thing as attacking the stray. And I think they're two separate things. What we are seeing more and more through these economic times is that you have combined households. Lots of elderly parents are moving in with their <clears throat> adult children and vice versa. Typically, they have a couple of animals of their own. Grandma moves in. She has an animal. Then we've got a situation where they're over the lemon. We go out and write citations, and then they start the process for the special use permit, which then is on you guys' docket to approve the special use permit. What we're trying to do is we looked at other cities that are around us. We're relatively low. We tried to not go up drastically, just increase slightly, so that we can try to accommodate those type of situations. And then as far as the stray population goes, what we're trying to do is make our ordinances easier to enforce so that we can, not necessarily the stray, but the owners that let their dogs just roam free. We've got first, second, and third offenses. We've got some software that just got approved for a purchase that will help us do a better job of tracking addresses and, and owners and be searchable so that we can search from now through the future if you've been in trouble with animal control before, where we don't always know if one animal control officer goes out there, writes citations, a year later another animal control officer goes out there and writes, writes citations, it's never really correlated that they've had this before. So this new software will allow us to track that so that we can start going with the first, second, and third offenses and increasing the fines. We're hoping to, uh, and like the breed specific and stuff, we can get away from just going on a call because of what the dog looks like and going on calls for dog behavior. And in, in that, hopefully we'll free up more time to start trapping some of our stray population. We did order and have more traps and we've been setting those out and been very successful with trapping some problematic stray dogs. Hal, did you wanna say something else? Yeah, I, I noticed that throughout this ordinance, there is this provision well, not throughout, a couple of places where you, um, like with a vicious dog, either, you, the solution to the problem is, is that you uh, remove the dog, you euthanize the dog or you remove it from the city. Now, uh, 
the vicious dog is one that's already caused either death, great bodily injury, uh, serious harm. There's something about the idea of transferring that problem. And it says out of the city, so I live in Kansas City, Kansas, but I'll just transfer it out to Edwardsville and let Edwardsville deal with it, or Bonner Springs. And at the risk of, I know this is abhorrent to people involved in animal rescue, but if a dog is declared vicious, wh why should the dog not be euthanized? Because you're, you're talking about not a dog that has just bitten somebody, <coughs> You're talking about a dog that has already demonstrated the capacity to, to do great harm to someone, and assuming there's none of the exceptions. I, I don't see what transferring the pro why that's a good solution just to take the dog to the country, as we used to say. Exactly. Well, it doesn't make him any less vicious in the country. What, what, what other alternative to euthanasia is there? Well, I tell you what, the, that came from um, what cities surrounding Kansas City, Kansas have um, when an animal. So, so, so they'll move like, them to Kansas City, Kansas, exactly. and that way they've solved their problem. <laughs> exactly. It happens all the time. Um, traditionally, the animal is euthanized, um, but sometimes people, and I, I worked on a case where someone did that, and it was a sustained attack on a human and another animal, and they said, well, I'll just take it out in the country where you can roam free. And that was the scariest proposition. And so I don't know that our committee would have a problem with euthanasia, period. Um, we, we just use some standard language uh, with surrounding cities. Um, so we do want to be tough on those animals um, and those an owners. I'm not, I'm not for euthanasia, but we're talking about a very small number of dogs, and we're also talking about a dog that has already, I, I, I don't think the right solution you know, maybe that you can train the dog to be better. I, maybe there's a plan that could be developed, and they could, you know, make a vicious dog. Not, but you got to, you can't just dump this problem on some other city or community. I, would, I can't go for that. How would you like well, to change the they language? Well, an alternative to euthanasia that would work, I would say euthanasia is the only solution. As harsh as it, that is. How does, the, how does the commission feel about that, us in the standing committee? Do we have any feelings on that? I'm okay with, I'm okay with what uh, Commissioner Walker said. Okay, and in that section, that's 27-217, um, it gives the discretion up to the court either, so it allows the judge to make the decision whether to euthanize them or to move them out of the city. So um, it gives, the, the judge could look to see if there are alternatives and make that determination, but if you don't want that language in that, we can also um, remove that and just say that the animal shall be euthanized, that the court shall order the I'm animal. I'm raising the question because I don't like the idea of transferring a vicious dog to some other community where that dog may do that again to somebody else. That, that just seems foolish. If, you've got, if we've gotten to the point where we get to that viciousness determination, I don't see, I'm not convinced that we, we ought to get, put it in Rowan Park, for example, <laughs> send it over there. Okay, so it looks like we have two things to talk about. Is there anything else that you'd like to say, Captain Angel? Because you've been definitely involved in this from day one. Does anybody have any questions of me specifically as no. far as the different ordinance changes other than what we've discussed? Board Member Bryant. I don't know if this is so much of a question as if we go through with this process and the subsequent processes that will go through changing budgets and, and, and adding people, have we set goals? I mean, number one, do we know a rough estimate of how many strays we have in our city? Do we have goals on what percentage we would plan to reduce or how we would reduce or, or, or at the end of spending this money and, and doing all this extra work? How will we know we were successful? I think it goes back to the slide that Katie had on the stuff that we could do. If we've got increased licensing and we know where the dogs are at in our city, uh, do the online deal if we, in, in the pit bull ban is what's kind of been prohibitive on the online licensing. Uh, if we have that, 
that would be, uh, you know, another way. There's lots of things when we look at the number of animals that are impounded, if we can, you know, reduce the, the number of animals that are running loose. It's not as many, I know everybody says stray, and we do have packs of stray animals, but most of them are not strays. Most of them are owned. They go, they go home at night for a meal at the same house at least every other day. Uh, so what we're really looking at is a way to make owners responsible for their dogs. If they're feeding them and they're letting them run free, then we want to, here's your ticket number one, here's your ticket number two, here's your third strike and, and you're out type thing. That's how we, and then if we are going down the streets of KCK and we're not seeing a dog running loose every other block, we'll know that we're, we're making Im an impact. Well, you'll also have your new information that you can get from your data that you'll be collecting. The new software, once that's implemented, will help us immensely <coughs> on data. Because right now everything's done basically on Excel spreadsheets at Animal Control. Board Member Bryant. I would also want to believe that we would see an increase in revenues by more animals being licensed. And which, that, yeah, that's why that's in Which there. would hopefully help offset some of the increased costs Correct. to this program. Correct. Okay. And also the, uh, the software, once we can start implementing that and we can search by names, addresses, et cetera, and start doing the first, second, and third violation so that we can ensure that the ticket written to them is the correct ticket that they need so that the court system will impose the correct fee. And they're not just getting the same fee over and over again. They actually start stair-stepping up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we're going to start, we're going to open this up to those who are against first, and we give you two minutes if you will come to the uh, microphone, give us your name and address, and give us your opinions. We appreciate that, and please, first person, come forward. Oh, I want to say this too. Can you please email, the, e email me this presentation so I can have it for my record? Your name and address, please. My name is Reverend Jimmy Banks. I live at 4105 North 112th Street, Kansas City, Kansas. And uh, I'm here to speak against uh, the pit bull reference in this ordinance. Uh, from a personal standpoint, um, a few years ago, was it 2005, 2006? when uh, a lady that I've known a long time, and she's got a lot of relatives here tonight, uh, lived next door to a pit bull owner, uh, and she had complained on numerous occasions. And on the, her fatal day, this pit bull jumped the fence and killed her in her yard. Now, um, when you look at the data and the genetic predisposition of pit bulls to attack, to bite, to hold, to shake until death. I think there ought to be some reasonable exception uh, from any other dog. Data collected from 2005 to 2012 indicates that there have been 251 uh, dog-related deaths in the United States. Pit bulls accounted for 60% of them. So I don't see how you can present any data that would suggest that they not be held apart as an exception to any rule that you make about dogs and the possibility of them turning violent and even uh, killing someone. So uh, uh, banning pit bulls, uh, one of the sites says saves lives and protects the innocent because these dogs attack without provocation, without warning. And most of their attack, uh, most of their victims are elderly or young people, people who don't have the ability to avoid and evade. 15 seconds. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak against? Please state your name and address. My name is Beverly McKinney, and I live at 2960 North 34th Street and have lived there 30 years. Uh, what I, I, my concern is, I have two concerns here, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to wrap it up in two seconds here. 
uh, I know you all are mending the city ordinance and so forth, but my, my thing is on be it a dangerous dog versus a, a vicious dog. Uh, you know, the way you identify a vicious dog as a, a dog biting someone. Well, it could be a little chihuahua that bites someone and quote, is considered a vicious dog opposed to a pit bull, you know, that may not be able to, to damage someone. But nevertheless, you got three city ordinances out right now on the books that concerns pit bull. Seven two, uh, 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 219 uh, that concerns the pit bull. You got, uh, uh, that's when you go and the animal control gives that one out. Uh, the other pit bull ordinance that, that deals with uh, pit bull is uh, ordinance, uh, was it? I think it's 141. I don't know if that, that's the one that the city clerk's office is dealing with on, on pit bulls. One, is it 141? No, 7130 is pit bull. Now I went to the, 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 the district, I mean the director of animal control and was given out 7219 concerning pit bull. I went to the city clerk's office and they gave me out 7130 concerning <coughs> pit bull. So I don't know which ordinance applies. My second question is uh, on the pit bull thing, as far as registering a dog that does not belong to you, uh, the non-residence ordinance, ordinance that, uh, that, that, uh, that we have on the books. You series. have 15 seconds. Okay, you have two of those on the books. Who registered the dog? The, the non-owner, do you have a visitation? Is there a statute that's saying a, a non-owner of a dog can have a, a visiting dog on their premises without having it registered? You know, I don't, I don't understand that particular ordinance in that as far as a non-registering, right. uh, a non-resident dog. All right, time's up, thank you. Anyone else would like to speak against? Please come forward to the microphone, state your name and your address. If there's another one who wants to speak after him, could you please stand next to him so we could get this done a little bit faster? Thank you. Yes, uh, my name is Dennis McConnell. Uh, my address is 6954 South 88th Street, Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, won't hold you long. I'm the son of the lady that was referenced uh, earlier, Jimmy Mae McConnell. Um, I have concerns with consideration of removal of the uh, prohibition of the pit bulls. Um, I guess my one question I have is, is, is there was an ordinance, it was created for some reason. So obviously there was some concern. There's other cities throughout the United States that also have ordinances um, restricting, if you will, pit bulls <coughs> in certain communities. There's a reason for that. Pit bulls are the type of breed where unfortunately, unlike other dogs or other breeds, once they begin to attack, the person involved may have a pretty good chance of survival. With the pit bull, that is not the case. And I'm a witness to that, that is not the case. So reconsideration should be made. I'm not sure why it even came up, but there was a reason that it was put in place in the beginning and feel that it should remain intact. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Please state your name and address. I'm Reverend Mac McConnell. Uh, Pastor Third Missionary here in Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, I too am standing against the repealing of this particular ordinance um, because uh, we've had a personal loss. And uh, this particular dog uh, is one, as has already been stated, uh, has, has, has already done damage. And to put this law back on the books so that uh, to take it off so people can keep dogs and uh, in, in, in their backyards and so forth and so on that will attack uh, other citizens is, is, is just unthinkable. And so I'm standing, and there's a large group of us here tonight, we're standing, say, don't do this, please don't do this. Reconsider this. Do not take this, uh, do not repeal this particular ordinance. Uh, let it stay as it is. Anyone else? Could we uh, see people stand against the... Yes, if there's some people that don't want to speak and want to stand uh, that are against the uh, ordinance. So if we have tons of people standing on the right side. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Okay. Could somebody get a count of that? Somebody Sorry, got. guys. They asked to do a squat. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. You're you're wanting to speak for against? Okay, that's all right. Yes, ma'am. All, right. all right, go ahead. Please come to the microphone. <coughs> State your name and your address. My name is uh, Ella Haynes, and my address yeah, is 2440 North 37th Street. And I personally had an experience uh, with the pit bull uh, one Thanksgiving. My family and I had gathered to have Thanksgiving dinner and the children were out playing, and they were yelling and screaming, and we just thought, why are they making so much noise? But there was a pit bull who had come across the street and had entered, uh, entered the yard of my niece. He attached himself to this child, and we looked, and she was screaming. All the kids was running and screaming. We came out with brooms and everything else we could find. The pit bull will not release himself from that child drug the child in the house, and my son at the time was like 12 years old, was the only male there because the other guys hadn't gotten there. And the only way that we could get that pit bull off of that child was he grabbed the, the dog at, uh, by the collar in the back of his neck and kind of choked him like, we opened the bathroom door and threw him in the bathroom and when the animal control got there, they got the, the, the dog, took him out, and put him in that truck. And that dog was so vicious until the whole truck was just shaking back and forth, back and forth. I, too, agree that they should be banned. Thank, Thank you, you ma'am. You already spoke, correct? I just want to ask one question. Oh, you already spoke, correct? We're going to have to answer some questions at the end of this. All right, yeah. now what we'll do is we'll have those that are for the changes come forward. Who would like to speak? Uh, if you. My name is Jennifer Brown. I live at 1817 South Mill Terrace, Kansas City, Kansas. Does anybody know where pit bulls originated from? Nanny dogs. Nanny dogs from England. They were nanny dogs for kids. That's where they originated from. It's the owner that makes the dog, not the dog. Okay, you have to be... Whoa, whoa, wait. Here's what we're not going to do. We're not going to clap. We're not going to cheer. We're not going to do anything. We are here for a very serious subject. We will maintain order. And please, I, I know this is a very emotional subject, but we need to keep in every, this meeting intact. My children are 17 and 15 years old. My children have been raised with pit bulls. Okay, they have not bit or been vicious or any acts of any kind of violence towards my children or anybody else. And it's always been said that if your dog doesn't like somebody, you shouldn't like somebody. So therefore, if they're vicious or something towards somebody, they're, at, they're obviously feeling something from that person. Okay, pit bulls are just like any other dog. They should be treated and created equally, regardless. A chihuahua can come after you just as fast as a freaking pit bull can. It is the owner that makes the dog, not the dog. Thank you, ma'am. David Hurlbreak, 4015 North 111th Street, Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, commissioners, staff, fellow citizens, I stand to speak to you not only as a private citizen, but as chairman of the, the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission. And I would speak in favor of your portion of this ordinance that would remove the special use permit from our planning and zoning agenda. <laughs> there have been many months when we have had as many as five cases in front of us regarding additional dogs and a special use permit. Uh, I would speak to you and say that that is not an efficient use of our time. Thank you very much. Thank you. State your name and your address, please. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Ashley Folsom, 1812 North 39th Street. Um, I'm speaking in, pro um, in approval of the proposed changes. First of all, the cats, the stray cats, the trap, neuter, and release has um, shown promise in other cities. We do have a lot of stray cats. 
um, and that would begin to help the population of stray cats be reduced here in Kansas City, Kansas. Um, also, raising the limit of animals that someone can have would be great. There's a lot of responsible dog owners in Kansas City, Kansas, who are limited to only two dogs, and they could provide homes for some of the dogs in our shelter. Um, a lot of the cities surrounding us have a higher number of dogs that people can have, or cats, and that seems to work well. Um, and then also in regards to lifting the breed restriction, um, the Centers for Disease Control has stated that really having breed-specific ordinances raises a lot of issues. Um, fatal attacks represent a small proportion of dog bite injuries, uh, and really it's more efficient to have other alternatives <coughs> and not have breed-specific ordinances because any type of dog could cause a dangerous attack or a harmful attack. So they're encouraging from the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, something other than a breed specific ordinance, which I think if you, um, you know, really look through the changes that are proposed, that's addressed. So just wanted to say it's a good idea. Thanks. Thank you. Lisa McKenzie, 2940 North 81st Street. Uh, I'm a KCK resident and I support the changes to the ordinances. Thank you. Hi, I'm Cheryl Buell, and thank you for all the hard work on the task force. I really sincerely appreciate it. I am in favor of the entire animal control proposal as written, and I want to see animal control have an opportunity to be able to do their job and attack and go after dangerous dog owners that are causing the issues. I'm going to tell you about one little short story. This is why I'm not in favor of a pit bull ban. This dog, Nico, was held in our city shelter for over nine months. The resources it took, the taxpayer dollars, the police that were involved, animal control that were involved, this is just one of many stories of a dog that was confiscated because he looked like something. He was on Craigslist, an advertisement. Uh, owners were trying to find a new home. He was too much dog for them. Police ha uh, came along with animal control to take a dog that had a home, who had his shots, who was not running at large, had not threatened anybody, had not bit anybody, and we held him in the city shelter. D DNA tests were run. Um, the city had to feed him, house him. Over $3,000 of taxpayer money was spent housing this dog. These are many, many cases like this. Um, we started going to court to fight for our dogs because they kept getting picked up and identified by neighbors who were scared, thinking, well, that dog's got short hair. He's got a boxy head. He must be one of those vicious pit bulls. And I do not want to see our animal control resources, our tax dollars wasted on this kind of legislation or policy because it's ineffective. There's lots of data out there. There's 20 years worth of data, and I'm sure the task force went through all of that, that supports breed bans do not work. The people that own dogs that have homes you have 15 seconds. get picked up by this. I support this. A vote yes means you stand for public safety. Thank you. Thank you. Was your point that that is not a pit bull? Yes, he was DNA tested. He had one, he had, uh, he was mixed mutt. He was not a pit bull. He was a uh, 125th American <coughs> Shire Terrier. We wasted that much money and resources on this dog. There's tons of cases like that in this city where people were, dog, where their dogs were taken, and then they went to court, and that was a real waste of time and money. But we could have been attacking the issue at hand, which is dangerous dogs and those owners that are causing problems. Thank you. My name is Rachel Jefferson. I live at 431 Greeley Avenue. First of all, I want to say that I am very sensitive to your loss. And um, I know that nothing can bring your loved one back. But I do also want to say that that was actions of one particular dog who obviously had an irresponsible human owner. These dogs are not vicious by nature. They are made vicious by people. And so for us as humans to Penalize an uh, animal which has been taught to be vicious is just not right. We have to penalize the owners and not the animals. They do not come out of the womb vicious. They are taught how to be vicious. They can also be taught how to be kind. So, I mean, I think we really need to take a look at what we are doing as human beings and not blame the dogs. Thank you. Thank you.
Commissioner Kiernan. Hi. Um, I'm Stephanie. I live at 620 Sandusky, and I also work at the Kansas City, Missouri Animal Shelter um, for KC Pet Project. We're um, located in a city that allows pit bulls to be owned as long as they're spayed and neutered. Um, I was just coming to provide my support for all of these changes with regard to our ordinances. Um, I have the unique perspective of not only being a Kansas City, Kansas resident, but also um, working full time in a position where I work with these animals every single day and have a lot of positive experiences with them. Um, with regarding that, I just wanted to say that um, I totally agree that I think that a better use of our taxpayer dollars is going after any dog that proposes or rather poses a threat to any citizen of Kansas City, Kansas, regardless of what that dog looks like. Um, if it's out there in your neighborhood and it's not safe, I don't want it in our neighborhood either and I'm right there with you. Um, I just think that unfortunately that goes way beyond just one breed. So I think that it's ineffective to take um, own pets out of their homes that don't pose a threat. But the other thing I really wanted to say I'm grateful for is the opportunity that we have um, to talk about TNR. I'm also a gigantic supporter of trap neuter return, um, being somebody who works in animal welfare. And I don't know if you're accepting documents, but I have um, some written literature as far as like how it works, um, why it's successful and things like that. So um, no need to submit them if you feel like you've already got what you need um, on that topic. But I just wanna say as somebody who recently bought a home in Kansas City, Kansas over the summer, um, we have a really big kitty problem. Um, we've also got it in Strawberry Hill. And I know that a lot of people have been kind of moving into that part of town. Um, and I'm grateful for any animal control ordinance changes that will benefit our community. Um, um, home ownership values, things like that, um, by not having animal problems in our neighborhood. So I'm really grateful that that's even on the table, and I will hold on to these if anybody needs could, them. Could you please give those documents to the clerk? Yeah, happily. And if anybody, um, I'll take it offline. I won't hold everybody hostage. But if you anybody wants to talk Ten about seconds. trap neuter return and how to execute that in the community, if it pleases the court, um, I'm happy to be a resource for that because I can talk to you all about it. So <laughs> thanks. Well, I'm telling you what, you squeezed it all. <laughs> <laughs> Please, sir. I'm um, Darren Dillard, and I stay at 7801 Webster. Um, the breed specific deal is very sketchy because you know the pit bull is not the only violent dog. You got Rottweilers and so forth. There's no racial specifics. I'm a black man, he's a white man. You're not basing it off what I do because I'm black. The law is the law. So if my dog does harm, I need to be accountable. If his dog does harm, he should be falling under the same statute as me. I've owned pit bulls for 17 years. I've had a dog confiscated from my address years ago. That was my children's dog from birth. So I had to, in turn, ship it out to the country in Spring Hill, Kansas, where I'm from, where it still resides today. So you know, it's an emotional deal because it's my family pet and whatnot. So no, you know, I, I don't downplay the significance and the harm that the dog, you know, caused Mr. McConnell, but you guys, that don't know about the pit bull, the lady just stated, you can easily see a boxy head and assume that's a pit bull dog. There's so many dogs that emulate or look like, and people are breeding dogs and they don't know what they're breeding. So in turn, you're getting violent dogs. You know what I mean? Just breeding the breed and dogs are getting out and they're straight or whatnot. But dogs act off fear, you know, or what they're trained to do. A pit bull, if you own them, you wouldn't own another dog. That That's just what I feel. I, I hope that you guys honestly look at it it's been forever since the pit bull has been a you know legal in kansas city kansas i mean bonner they're they're doing it now you know so just look at it fairly that's all i'd ask thank you sir my name is joe wanda from lee summit missouri uh just want to share a quick story that um i was actually walking my pit bull uh, he's a family pet and uh, was attacked by a Rottweiler uh, was a year and a half ago. And um, just want to say that, you know, any dog can be vicious. It's, it's, and we should definitely, definitely look at um, doing something about those dogs, not, not being specific about a certain breed. Uh, breed really has nothing to do with it. It's about how they're raised. Uh, another thing uh, that I wanted to say is that <coughs> earlier it was talked about um, if someone comes on your property and that dog and, and your dog bites that person, then you would not your dog would not be a dangerous dog. At that point, I was a little confused there because, I mean, you, nobody would have a dog roaming at large um, on their front property. Property, and if they did, and the dog got away, you know, it might be picked up by animal control, and you get a ticket for it. Uh, but for those responsible owners, uh, they have a dog on a 
a leash or a dog on a tether and they're watching, watching that dog and someone were to approach that was unwanted and maybe even told to stay away uh, and they got bit, then I, I, I feel like there should be some protection there for the, for the property owner. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hi, good evening. My name is Kelly Knetter, and I live at 12636 Leavenworth Road in Kansas City, Kansas. Um, I am definitely in favor of the um, proposed changes to the ordinance. I think anything we can do to lighten the load of our animal control to be able to focus on the more important um, cruelty cases and issues that they're faced with all the time I think is important and, and we're taking the right steps, it sounds like tonight, to make good change in our city. Um, I'm also a photographer and I donate my services to Casey Pet Project in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, I photograph anywhere from 20 to 40 animals a month, probably 75% of them are pit bulls. Um, I would like to say that I've never had an issue um, with a pit bull in the time I've been there. I am usually seeing these dogs for the first time after they've been in a kennel for five days without um, really any interaction because they're on a stray hold. They're overstimulated from the overcrowding in the shelter and they come out to the play yards getting fresh air for the first time and they have never been anything but loving and warm to me. Uh, likewise, I've had dogs that I never thought would be aggressive be aggressive towards me. And so I would encourage you to really think about not putting a ban on a specific breed, but really rather judging that dog based on its behavior and, and the actions that it has committed possibly to a person. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good evening. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Wilcox. I live at 1108 North 19th Street and I'm a veterinarian and I work at Great Plains SPCA and I work almost every single day with a variety of breeds including a pretty healthy proportion of pit bulls. So I'm not going to echo what everyone else has said um, that they're, they're great dogs, which they are, um, but I just wanted to point out that these bans will, that prohibit pit bulls are also meaning that pit bulls are not getting the care that they need. I know of a number of people that incorrectly believe that if they bring their pit bull to the vet, I'm gonna call the city and have it apprehended out of my clinic. Not the case, but it's still preventing these animals from getting care. Um, and also that in the unfortunate, very tragic instance of the McConnells, perhaps if there had been a neighbor that, you know, <coughs> this dog is barking in the yard all the time. Maybe if it wasn't breed specific language, if they weren't worried that they were gonna call and get the dog hauled off and euthanized, maybe they would be willing to call and say, this is a nuisance dog. And if that dog wasn't left barking every day, all day in the yard, and maybe instead was flagged as a nuisance animal, um, it wouldn't have been so ready and uh, to take the, you know, to, to attack. Um, maybe we could have caught it earlier before um, such a horrible thing happened. Because I know lots of people might you know, I might see a dog running around and want to make a call, but a, a lot of us, I think, wouldn't take that step if we thought it was going to result in the animal's death. Um, maybe if we had kinder and non-breed specific language regarding uh, owned and sociable you animals, 15 seconds. we wouldn't have the issues that we have. Um, also, trap, neuter, return, I do all the time, and it is very wonderful and effective at reducing all those unwanted behaviors. Most of the problems come with the intact status, so if you get them, thank picked, you so much. <coughs> My name is Eliza Grace. I live at 2117 Central Avenue. I'm an animal rescuer, and it's hard to do my job with a two dog limit. I'm not asking for 10, three sounded good, I was hoping for four. Um, I do a lot of TNR in my community, I've been doing it since 2006. At first, the people in my community were very skeptical and you know, they just weren't into my ideas at all, but they've seen the results of my hard work. No more cats and heats howling in the neighborhood in the middle of the night. No more tomcats spraying the flowers. Most important, no more unwanted kittens in my community anymore. Um, please say yes to the TNR. And uh, I'd love to have another pit bull. I haven't had one since I've moved to Kansas City, Kansas in 2004 great dogs. Thank you. Hi, 
Hi, um, my name is Zoe Agnes Woboda. I'm a KCMO resident. Um, I have been, I've owned a pit bull for about four years now. I love her to death. I'm a very proud owner. Um, currently, I'm in search for my first home to buy, um, and I'm very limited to where I can buy. I, um, one of the speakers before said that the money you guys are spending on holding pit bulls in your shelter is ridiculous, but also I think that you guys are preventing from money from coming in. I would love to give my tax dollars to a community that supports my dog. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Christina Costa. I live at 618 Vale Street, and I am all in favor for lifting the breed-specific breed ban because I was maybe a little skeptical at first, like all of you. I am a researcher. I love facts over hearing rumors and stories. And I've been around the pit bull breed, and they are not they're just like any other dog. I've rescued dogs big and small since I was a kid. We've always opened our home to strays. And um, I'm just asking the committee to look a lot more into it and to lift the ban because I think it would save us a lot of dollars moving to the Wyandotte community from Johnson County. I think that, you know, I'm, I like the community a lot and I would hope that we can save money somehow in a more efficient way. So I'm in favor for that. And then the trap and neutering for cats, I didn't think it was a big problem until I moved over off of Ruby where we have millions of cats. I'm actually participating, um, trapping some cats and putting them out there because they keep the mice population down. I'm a gardener, so that benefits me. And you know, they're not really that vicious. Some of these cats have been owned by irresponsible owners that just let them out. So I'm all in favor for that. And also um, tighter laws on irresponsible owners. Um, I'm not in favor. I like to walk down Metropolitan and exercise, but there's so many stray dogs and cats. And a lot of these dogs are owned by people, but they're irresponsible letting the dogs run at large. And a lot of these dogs are not pit bulls. They're, you know, smaller dogs that sometimes will try to bite you or nip at you. And I think that mainly own a responsibility and get more money back to the community because I would love to stay here. And maybe when I purchase another home, maybe I'll buy another home here. So I appreciate you guys. Listening. Thank you. <coughs> Hello, my name is Ashley Flynn. I live at um, 3122 North 56th Street. Um, I had to write it. I'm really uncomfortable <coughs> speaking. Anyways, um, first I wanted to say thank you for even considering making these changes. Um, I know there's a misconception that uh, pit bulls will turn without warning. Um, there is always a reason for a dog's behavior regardless of its breed. Um, as owners, we need to educate ourselves and our children on how to interact with animals and recognize specific behaviors in them. Um, the pit bull used to be an American symbol. Um, they were big. It's really interesting to learn about their um, history during like World War um, I. They were um, America's favorite breed, uh, favorite choice for a companion dog. Um, they're loyal service dogs, police dogs, and other areas, um, and some of our best friends. There is no such thing as a pit bull problem. There is irresponsible owner problems, backyard breeder problems, and a problem of ignorance to the breed. There are many myths about them that just aren't true. They don't have log jaws, they aren't bred to attack people, and they actually have one of the highest, um, they do actually have one of the highest temperament pass rates according to the American Temperament Test Society. It was 86.8%. Um, making these changes won't create dangerous dog problems, but strengthen the laws to protect people from dangerous dogs um, of all breeds. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Ross Stewart. I live at 620 Sandusky in Strawberry Hill. I just moved up here in June with my fiance, Stephanie, who is uh, an employed KCPP worker who's very enthusiastic about this subject. Uh, I'm gonna gloss over all the other points that everybody else has made, but namely, I'd just like to you know, attack one little point, and it's that we had a housewarming party, and I feel like everything went really great. It's a really good party, lots of our friends came, lots of professionals came, I'm an attorney. A lot of my friends came that have firms in different parts of the city, Kansas City, here, Kansas City, Missouri, Overland Park, Olathe. They loved it, never been to the area. I think it's a really neat area. House prices are pretty cheap, they can move up here. Number one complaint I had, random dogs running up and down the street. I left to go to my car, I got a dog barking at me. We have four or five rotating dogs in our block. They're owned, people love them, they're taken care of, they have collars. But I feel like if we're taking this much attention and time to focus on one breed and to do one thing, and we spent, that's a lot of money, $3,000 on one dog, that didn't do anything when I've got dogs running up and down my block day and night and that's the number one complaint I got we love your area there's a lot of bars up here it's great 
There's some really good Mexican restaurants up here. It's great. I can buy sausage down the street from my house. I can walk down the street and buy an egg. You can't do that where I live now. Oh, yeah, well, sorry about the dogs that barked at you when you got in your car. So, you know, I'd seriously cons you know, hope that you all are considering this because there's so many different ways these resources could be used. And I'd love to have some of my friends move across the street or down the block. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Commissioners, thank you for the process more than anything. My name is David Swanson. and I live in Overland Park where we also have a pit bull ban. It's a pretty vague thing. It's determined by one single individual in Overland Park about whether or not a dog is a pit bull. But the one thing that I want to say about them is uh, banning a dog specifically does not address the issue that is at the core of this and that is whether a dog is dangerous or not. And banning this specific breed or any specific breed does about as much good as putting up a gun free zone sign. It's not going to keep a crazy person from coming in and shooting up the place. Thank you very much. My name is Gail Brown. I live at 5017 11, or, uh, Lathrop Avenue, Kansas City, Kansas. I've been at, in this issue from both sides. We have a problem with uh, stray cats. We have a colony. Um, I have reduced that colony from 28 cats down to 14, four of which are mine. Uh, I'm still working on the other 10. We've been doing this at our own expense, but I have been fined twice now for having cats and I have never ever had a cat trapped or even attempted to be taken from my property when the animal control comes the first thing they do is whip out the ticket book and write tickets and they count the cats and they write tickets that's all they do they have never done any trapping or have, they've never offered me a trap um, I my animals are licensed that I have as my personal pets uh, and the other issue on the breed specific dogs, I've been attacked twice in my life by a dog, enough to have to have stitches. Um, I was attacked by a German Shepherd that knocked me to the ground and gnawed on my hip. I was attacked by a Sharpe, which is a smaller dog uh, and never known to bite according to the owner, but it bit me on the leg and I had to have stitches. So you can't I think the breed specific thing is a bogus issue. I think it's a vicious dog. It's what the, the, the owners and the vicious dogs are what we need to go after. If you have a dog that's bitten someone more than once, then that dog should be taken and whatever the city says done to it. You should have 15 be done seconds. To it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Heather Purdy and I live in Shawnee, Kansas, and I support TNR. I have personally TNR'd 100 cats this season alone. 45 of those are from KCK. It's done out of my own money, so no cost to taxpayers, just allowing them to live here and be cats. Nobody has brought up the left ear tip and how important that is to these guys, so they're identified for future reference if they're ever trapped or causing any issues animal control knows that they are already spayed and neutered they should be causing no trouble and they should not be trapped again or hauled away or anything like that so I just want to let you know I support TNR thank you thank you uh, thanks for mentioning that we hadn't mentioned the ear tipping thing but it's in the ordinance thanks for mentioning that Hi, good evening, commissioners. My name is Courtney Thomas, and I am a resident of Kansas City, Missouri, and the president of Great Plains SPCA. I just want to applaud you all for taking um, these changes and considering them this evening. I'd like to share with you that professionals such as the Centers for Disease Control, the American Bar Association, the American Veterinary Medical Association, and many other professional organizations are not in support of breed-specific legislation. The experts have already done the work, so let's not debate this subject any further. Let's let it move forward um, as it should. Let's focus on giving our animal control officers and departments, as well as shelters um, around this community, the resources to do their job to protect this community from all dangerous dogs, not dogs that are a specific breed. 
which poses the question, what is a pit bull? And I guarantee you that if you asked the audience here tonight and showed them pictures of 25 dogs, you'd have 25 different answers in many cases. So let's focus our resources on what really matters, and that's creating a safer community. As well as the TNR, um, it is the single most effective way to control pet overpopulation, specifically in cats, um, of course. And I, I highly support uh, this change and hope that you'll consider these things tonight. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ken Snyder. I live at 3216 Barnett Avenue, and I'm here to speak as not only a Kansas City, Kansas resident, but as a Humane Education Resource Officer and Manager of Facilities Maintenance at Great Plains SPCA. What you have with the trap, neuter, and return policy is something that makes the best sense that, that I can even think. I have a lady that's in the audience that probably doesn't want to come up and speak, but I'm going to relay a little bit of her story. She went so far as to take out a mortgage on her property in order to trap, neuter, and return feral cats to the area, trying to reduce the population. Animal Control came out, trapped those cats that were already ear-tipped, already sterilized, and vaccinated, because that's part of the process, took them, and they were euthanized. Years later, the problem still exists. The colony has reestablished itself and has actually grown because of ir other irresponsible owners allowing unsterilized cats to roam free. It just makes good sense. It's something that needs to be done. It's something that should have been done a long time ago. Only thing I can say about breed-specific legislation is I had a neighbor that had a pit bull who moved out because he would rather leave and keep his animal than he would to stay and surrender it. And I was cornered in my yard at one time by a vicious Rottweiler. I don't see any restrictions on Rottweilers in Kansas City, Kansas. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Hannah Beam. I live at 10916 Kimball Avenue in Kansas City, Kansas. Um, I am definitely in favor of the TNR program. I know personally that we do have a feral cat issue in Kansas City, Kansas. We, I've lived in my house for five years and the feral cat colony in my neighborhood alone has grown. Uh, when we first moved in, it was about seven, eight cats. Um, it's now up to probably about 14. Um, I personally don't have the money to trap them and take them in to get neutered, but if there were programs available for that, I would absolutely volunteer to help to do that. Um, it's, I mean, for me personally, yeah, it's the cats in heat howling at night um, and seeing them on the side of the road because they've been hit by a car, it breaks my heart. Um, and that's just me as an animal lover. But, you know, people don't want to see that when they're driving down the street or coming to my house like, oh, there's dead cats all over the place. Um, and about the breed specific legislation, um, obviously, I'm not going to sit here and say what everybody else has been saying. I myself have been bitten by two dogs, one a German Shepherd, one a Dalmatian. Um, and I have personal experience. A number of my friends have pit bulls, and they are the most loving, loyal dogs. Um, I've never been scared of one since. And any dog can be vicious. Again, it's how they're raised, not the breed. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Clark Richardson. I am a Kansas City, Missouri resident, and I just wanted to provide one brief anecdote as well as reiterate one point made by the president of the Great Plains SPCA. For me personally, I was a Kansas resident and grew up under the understanding that pit bulls were dangerous. Uh, I was raised uh, by my parents to believe this, um, and what I learned later on once I moved to the Kansas City, Missouri area with my girlfriend and her dog Oliver, who has a block head, although it'd be very difficult for anyone to determine that he's a pit bull. I personally think he could be a Great Dane, maybe has some Staffordshire Terrier. Regardless, he is the most wonderful dog I've ever been around and is, in fact, uh, has a much better disposition than my golden retriever I was raised with. What I learned was that eventually um, the sensationalism of the media uh, had really made an impact on me at a young age and uh, that any Pitbull article, any Pitbull attack was publicized in a much greater detail than any time a golden retriever attacked a young child, for instance. So 
Now, I can't move back to Kansas because I want to stay with my girlfriend and this wonderful dog, Oliver. So I'm over on the Kansas City, Missouri side. Um, and to, to the point that the Great Plains SPCA president made, I'm an attorney now, and she pointed out that neutral associations, such as the American Bar Association, have already uh, suggested that BSL is totally ineffective. Now, um, it's important to note that the American Bar Association is attempting to remain neutral here, uh, whereas the majority of the statistics you will hear uh, come, from an organ uh, come from a website. It's called dogbites.org. Now, in my line of work, uh, we have to apply what's called the Daubert or the Fry test to determine when you have evidence 15 seconds. should be admissible. Uh, from dogbites.org, no court of law, especially in the federal district court uh, here in the District of Kansas, would ever uh, admit evidence from dogbites.org, which was started by a woman who had personal experience with a pit bull attack. Thank you, and sir. Suffered it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michelle Davis. I l actually live in Kansas City, Missouri, but I was born in KCK, lived here most of my life. My entire family has lived here. My great grandpa um, immigrated from Sweden. Um, the point I think that's gotten lost is the reason we're here tonight is to make this city safer because the breed ban has failed. The breed ban did not save Jimmy Mae McConnell's life. Her family has reported tonight, and it was reported at the time, they had called animal control numerous times about this dog. And nothing happened. And they called and they called, and the dog ended up attacking her. And with the changes in this ordinance, I hope that the emphasis will be on ad addressing these problem animals before it escalates. Once again, the breed ban did not save her life. In fact, it may have cost her, her life. And my grandma was 86 and lived in Kansas City, Kansas when Jimmy Mae McConnell died. And I marched out in front of this building that K and held a sign that said, KCK Animal Control Failed Jimmy Mae McConnell. This, it was personal to me as well because no one should have to live in fear of the dog next door to them. Thank you. My name is Marcia Rupp. I live at 2816 North 46th Street. I think what I've listened to, everybody's kind of said it all. Uh, the only thing I do want to say is that if there is a dog that is out and animal control is closed, you can call the police. The police will come. They have those tickets. They can give the tickets as well as the police. Any dog that's out that's running loose, whether it's dangerous or not, shouldn't be and the owner should be accountable. So please call the police. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> if you're gonna go ahead and speak, go ahead and come on up here, ma'am. Go ahead and stand by her, that way we can get this done faster. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Stephanie Pearson. I used to be a Kansas City, Kansas resident um, until animal control euthanized my American Bulldog in mistaking that it was a pit bull. Um, the neighbors were complaining. I had a blockhead dog. Um, they came. I showed them her papers, her registered papers. She was spayed. Very friendly. Inside family dog. Um, they confiscated her on a hot day, put her in the truck, took her to their vet. He said, yeah, that's an American Bulldog. It's not a pit bull. Three different times I was harassed until finally they demanded that I turn my dog over. They took my dog and euthanized her. So now I live in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, I work at Spay and Neuter Kansas City. We work with pit bulls on a daily basis. And the little dogs, even though they don't do as much damage, can be much more vicious. So I would say lift the ban. Thank you. My name is Zelma Sully, and I live at 3333 North 123rd Street. I'm about to date myself. Uh, I do think that uh, there are elements in our community who, who love to promote pit bull fighting and betting and gambling 
on those dogs. And there had been some cases of little puppies trying to be stolen for that very purpose. And I would just like to remind this group that before these things came about, pit bulls were a very neighborly, very family type dog. Remember the dog in, hi, my dog's, I'm Buster Brown, I live in a shoe. My dog Tag, he lives in there too. That's, that was a pit bull. The RCA Victor dog was a pit bull. Petey of Our Game Comedies was a pit bull. And Helen Keller's dog was a pit bull. Thank you. My name is Jack Knight. I'm a city councilman for Bonner Springs, Kansas. And uh, I'm in favor of the pit bulls. I worked uh, very well with the attorney here. She was on the task force with us. And I speak highly of her. And we had one incident where the pit bull got out and the neighbors reported it. And that was the most loving dog that ever was. And uh, it was time we did something as a council. And it was time for a change. And uh, I think you guys ought to th take a serious look also like we did at Bonner. Because uh, there's a lot of good dogs out there. And uh, I'm in favor of the vicious, mean and vicious. Not for the, not for the breed. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Hi, my name is Tara Surprise. I'm a former Kansas City, Kansas resident. I now reside in Kansas City, Missouri. I am in favor of all of your changes to the ordinance so that I look forward to seeing Kansas City, Kansas be a safe and humane community. Thank you. Hi, my name is Angie Reitemeyer and I live at 2212 North 75th Street. Um, I am in support of all of the changes and I just want to give a quick story about the amazing breed of pit bulls. I am a preschool teacher and I'm also very involved in animal rescue. And so on Halloween, um, very crazy day with small children, I took one of their shelter dogs um, from the shelter I work with and she happened to be a pit bull. Um, and she was amazing at spending the entire day with three year olds hyped up on Halloween. And this dog who's perfect has been sitting in the shelter for almost two years because she's so restricted in where she can live. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Deborah Sweeten, 10330 Swartz, Edwardsville, Kansas. And uh, thank you all for very much, very much for taking a look at uh, and considering the proposals being changed. I would suggest vote yes. I'm very much in favor of it's a broad um, area of topics that we've covered tonight and um, increasing the number of, of animals that we can have in our homes would have a positive impact on those of us who do foster and rescue. It would help us to be able to save more animals and to not be in violation of the, regu of the ordinances um, so that we can continue to foster in our homes and be in compliance. It's really important to us in the, in the rescue community. And that's uh, another reason why I'm really asking for your vote of yes of these proposed changes. And um, thank you again so much for your time and consideration on this important subject. I'm gonna repeat again, if you're gonna speak, please come forward and get closer to the, to the microphone. Hi, I'm so we're Gina Mangles. Um, I'm the one that Ken was talking about, about taking the loan out of my house. Um, I'm a true believer in trapping and re-releasing. It does work. Um, I have seen that when you go in and you remove all those cats, another colony does move in uh, pretty quickly. So, um, you know, if we can have the support for spay and neuter and release, um, there are hundreds of cats out there and they just keep breeding. And I am doing everything I can um, to get that under control. Um, but we need more help. Um, so please support us and let us continue. And I was raised around pits. I never had any problems. I'd climb all over them. Um, it's the people that are raising the pits are the problem. Um, when you have a vicious dog, it's usually how they were abused or beaten or how they're treated. Thank you. Thank you.
My name is Nicole Caulfield. I'm a former resident of Kansas City, Kansas. Uh, I live, now live in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, I moved out because I have a pit bull dog and I was reported I had two weeks to find a place to live. Um, I'm a responsible citizen. I work for Hallmark Cards. I'm also the victim of a dog attack and so I understand this family's concern um, but it's not, not about the breed. It's about the owners who have the dogs. I also want to point out it's not about how the dogs are raised. Um, certainly, uh, it's how they're treated at the moment because I have a lot of rescue dogs who are in very bad situations uh, and I've worked for a rescue organization that um, I have come encounter with many, 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 many pit bull dogs and never been harmed by one. Um, but a dog that was held by an irres irresponsible owner in my neighborhood, um, I had to have my arm sewn back on in surgery. So um, I, I can understand both sides of the emotionality of this situation, um, but I also know that it should be an individual basis on a dog, whether it's dangerous or not. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, seeing no, no one else, what we'd like to do is have a show of hands of how many are in support of the changes instead of you standing up. Can somebody help me count that, please? <laughs> That's a lot. Jared, you took it on, man. Oh. <laughs> Jared says no. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay. You say 83? Well, first of all, I want to I want to thank uh, Commissioner Philbrook for bringing this up, a and it is definitely a emotional issue on on both sides. You know, uh, and it's not something that we take lightly. After, if there's a vote here tonight, and we'll know here in a little bit, uh, if it passes, it will go to the full commission, and you would have the opportunity then to come up and speak again. Now, I, I my daughter had two pit bulls when she was in, in college. I wouldn't let her come tonight. I didn't want her to talk and start crying about how, what she had to do when she came home from Kansas City, Kansas, to let the dogs go. And in fact, she came home, was taken to my farm, she stopped at my house to let the dogs relieve themselves. And I was turned in as a commissioner to the city for having two pit bulls. You know, and they weren't there three or four minutes. You could wrestle those dogs, you could chase those dogs, and you can love those dogs. And I too was attacked by a German Shepherd when I was a kid. So that's why I say there's emotion on both sides. We appreciate how you've handled yourself tonight. I do have some, a little bit of changes. We, we were talking about raising the, the, the dogs from two to three. And I just assume leave the dogs and the cats the way they are. And, and the reason being is we're having trouble with the, the current amount of dogs that are running around. I've had multiple calls about, hey, we like everything except the fact that we did, you would raise the dogs. So if we're going to pass this, I would want it to, to leave the dogs and the cats the way they were. Uh, Commissioner, I think that that's something that we discussed as being something we would be willing to consider because we are changing the process of getting a special permit. Um, the special permit is going to be easier to come by. Um, and I think that the fact that there's no hard and fast rule, that there is an application process, there are several cities that have higher pet limits, but that's all you can have. And right. you can't apply for a special And for permit. those of you out here and plus on TV, you can get permission to get another dog. It's, it, and, and there's a process that you have to go through. This isn't just set in stone, but th this is my request to make this work. Part of the, part of the intent of some of our changes is to take it away from the commission as a whole so we don't have to pass all of these individual uh, requests that it be handled by um, animal control and that they collect 
the monies, et cetera. So we're not looking at that, all right? So as far as animals, if that's a, if the number of animals is a big problem and we're gonna have trouble getting it through uh, to the full commission, you know, we gotta start somewhere. And so you know, I, I wouldn't vote against that change. Although I'd much rather have one more of each, but if that would be what's gonna stop us, I wouldn't vote against Mr. it. Mr. Walker, um, you know, my, my idea is that as a commission, we go ahead and send it to the commission. We have six other people, if you inc include the mayor and in that, that will have uh, comments and opinions. Uh, I will be prepared with my proposed amendments and we will amend it at that time on okay. the floor. Uh, I'm not necessarily against what Commissioner Kane said because I think once you get to three, then I should just one more and it, you know, there is, an, there is a number of dogs in one person's yard. If that person does not maintain their yard and pick up the excrement and deal with it. So I, I'm, I'm not sure how I feel about it, but what I would like to do, we've got a lot of people here who have taken time out of their day to speak on this subject, both pro and con. I think we need to send this forward to the full commission. As is. I'm as not, is. As is. Okay. But uh, certainly every commissioner and the mayor will be made aware before the next meeting that there will be proposed amendments. Uh, and I'm sure there may be other amendments from the other commissioners, maybe not. But you've heard what my concerns are, what Commissioner Keynes will vote on those amendments separately, and uh, they'll either up or down at the time that they're they're made thank you i appreciate that so i would make the motion to send this forward to the full commission as is subject to future amendment as discussed here tonight well i'll definitely second that roll call roll call i would like to say one thing i would hope that the approval of this and the extra work that'll be put will make our city safer with the, with the pets because I've lived here my whole life and I've heard many horror stories and I've seen a lot of strays. I uh, continue to see it. So. Aye. Mark Lynn? Aye. 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 Oh, I think I need to vote. Aye. <laughs> <laughs> <Still> <laughs> <laughs> I'm on a different page. All righty then. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you all for coming. When you leave, could you please be quiet? We've got uh, uh, one more item on the agenda here. Hey, and thank you all for coming. Can I make a statement? Thank Thanks, guys. I appreciate all your help, and uh, we'll be asking for more as this goes on. All right, what we're going to do is, is uh, Joe Connors isn't here. Gordon's going to give a report on the fire study. Is that correct, Gordon? It just won't take a second. Uh, yeah, Commissioner. Um, Please be quiet on your way out. Thank you. As we are preparing to, to do the fire study, uh, we will be interviewing prospective uh, firms to do the study uh, November the 25th and we anticipate uh, having the successful bidder on the contract by uh, mid-December. Right, thank you and uh, we were going to have one other report but I, to I told uh, Rob Richardson to go home because I knew this was going to last a while. Hey we're going to take about a six or seven minute break and then we will be back with the administration and human service standing committee meeting.
Conservation and Human Services Standing Committee, the less popular brother of the Public Works and Safety <laughs> Standing Committee. <laughs> we want to welcome everyone to this meeting. Public comment is welcome. Anyone wishing to speak on an item on the Standing Committee agenda may do so when the item is up for discussion. You'll have three minutes to state your comments. Please come forward to the microphone and you'll be recognized. <coughs> for accurate recording purposes, we ask all present to speak directly into a microphone. Would the clerk please call the roll? Here. 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 Next, we have the minutes from our September 15th minute. Second. There's a motion, motion and second. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Those minutes have been approved, which takes us to item one on our agenda. Um, item one is a presentation on the 8th Street YMCA. Is Mr. Henderson making that presentation? Please come forward. You can actually come all the way up here to the table if you'd like. Myself and two of my colleagues. Great, come on up. Now, is that three minutes each, or is that a total? No, yeah, you're, you're on the agenda, so you get to talk as long as you can. Simeon, could you introduce your, uh, the folks you're with? Team, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, my name is Simeon Henderson. I'm the executive director at the A Street YMCA. Yeah. My name is Garrett Webster. I am the achievers director. Juliana Rogers, I'm the membership engagement director at the A Street YMCA. So for those that are not familiar with the YMCA of Greater Kansas, we are a uh, not-for-profit organization, charitable organization, um, where we focus on three pillars. Uh, we put youth development, healthy living, and social responsibility. Um, the YMCA has 14 membership locations with over 14,000 members throughout um, the Greater Kansas City. Um, we have seven early learning centers as well as seven uh, Head Start centers with over 3,000 young uh, individuals as, uh, enrolled in those programs with over 1,000 um, volunteers throughout our organization. Um, we just want to mention a little bit about our memberships and some of our programs that we have at the YMCA. She's good. She knows she has to use the mic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so our goal here tonight is just to give you guys a little update of what we've been doing um, in the last year. Um, membership at the beginning of this year, um, just for the 8th Street location, we've gone from 487 units to 657 units um, just since January. Um, with that, 70% of those new memberships receive financial assistance in order to be able to um, afford their membership. And, um, and then also just a little bit about some of the programs that we've um, been offering. Um, we have brought the Early Learning Readiness Program to the 8th Street YMCA. We offer that four times a week, for, and that is free to the community. Anyone in KCK can attend that free of charge. Um, that is a program specifically for um, informal caregivers of children zero to five years old to help them prepare for kindergarten and um, just have a little bit more structure in their life um, as opposed to um, hanging out at their aunt's house for the day, uh, having a little more structure and getting ready for kindergarten. Um, and, and we do offer that four times a week. We just started that in September and it'll go through June. And um, as I mentioned, it is free to the community. Um, we also have our science, technology, engineering, and math program. It's um, STEM, you guys might be familiar with. Um, we offer that in two capacities with, within the 8th Street YMCA. We have a STEM camp in this, this past summer. It was a two-week camp. We had 16 kids per week um, through ages 8 to 12 years old um, where they came in. They built roller coasters out of pipe cleaners and all kinds of crazy things. It was amazing. Um, and, um, and also we have the first Lego League, which is a robotics team that is through the 8th Street YMCA and um, funded through us, but it takes place actually at Central Middle School. Um, and they have 15 um, kids in that group as well. Their actual, their first tournament is um, coming up on November 22nd. Um, and then, oh, and then also the Salsa Sabori Salud program is another one. Another program we have is a health and nutrition program. It is taught at um, th four times per year. So we have four sessions. Each session is six weeks. And that takes place at three locations within Wyandotte County. Um, actually, um, four locations. Yeah, three locations within Wyandotte County. And um, that is recognized by um, National Latino Children's Institute. Um, and it helps reach Hispanic Latino families, help them make healthy choices, increase their physical activity, and then pursue healthier lifestyles. And that is in response to the growing obesity rates um, and inactivity le levels among Latino children in America. 
Um, and then also Coaching Connections is a program that we offer. Um, currently that, off that program is just offered to members. That is a six week program where um, new members can meet with a healthy living coach to just start them on their wellness journey. And um, it, all of that is free as well. Um, and then our Why Wait program, and that is free um, through to all of KCK residents, um, which is a um, year-round program, nutrition program that helps people recognize where, you know, exercise is a big part of it, but there's also nutrition that comes into a healthier lifestyle. Um, so all of that is covered in this program, and, and that is free to KCK re or Wyandotte County residents as well. Well, thank you for allowing us to just come and share with you for a few moments. We appreciate all your support uh, in helping us to uh, support this community. Uh, just, a, just a few things that I want to talk about. Number one uh, program is our Night Courts program, which serves over 100 youth uh, throughout the county. Uh, and it is a Friday night uh, hoops or basketball program that serves our youth uh, ages 13 to 18. Uh, includes a leadership course. Uh, and is, we are partnered with Leadership 2000 and Associated Youth Services. Another youth uh, serving program, uh, again, in line with our, our three pillars, is our Young Achievers program, in which I lead the charge in serving our, our young people, seventh grade, uh, all the way through college. Uh, we serve over 450 youth uh, throughout the community, uh, helping them prepare for college, helping them prepare for careers, uh, most notably through our uh, college tour, which annually takes our students uh, to different colleges. Uh, the past two years have uh, earned over $1.4 million in scholarships on that tour. Just recently, our, our students attended a college fair. Uh, our seniors earned uh, just over two, uh, $219,000 in scholarships in this college fair just a few weeks ago. And uh, so we, we enjoy serving the youth uh, of the community. Uh, just recently, uh, as this weekend, we had our Young Achievers Law Day in which we actually were uh, in, in keeping with our college prep and career readiness theme we're actually able to serve our youth and our families and expose them to different careers uh, within law, one of those being legislation and the people who make the laws. Um, and so we were uh, pleased to serve over 75 of our youth that came out, uh, but we couldn't do that without the help of uh, over 31 volunteers uh, that help us with this program. And so we want to say thank you to Commissioner Maddox, thank you to uh, Commissioner Markley for coming out this weekend and supporting us in that effort uh, and making an impact on our youth. Thank you. Um, and the last thing I'd like to just mention is a couple of items uh, or several programs that we have um, when it comes to community programs. We have family nights, uh, we have a community garden, we have community health fairs. As recent as this weekend, we had a kidney screen um, from the Kidney Foundation and they came and saw several um, individuals and gave them an update on where they are with their health uh, related to that. And it actually was televised on, what was it, Fox? on Fox. Um, so we just would like to thank you, all of you. See several YMCA members in here. Um, keep up the good work and thank you for your time. Just, just a comment. Uh, first of all, next time bring pictures. And, th and the reason I say that is, is, is I know everything that you said because I've been there. Yes. I even tried one time to go at 7 o'clock at night. I never laughed so hard in my life because there are so many kids and the laughter and what they were being taught and how to cook and to, to eat healthy. And then, and then they know every single person that comes through that door. I mean, Commissioner Maddox and I are there all the time. Saw you both today, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and, and so bring the pictures because you, your words say it, but the pictures show it. Yes, sir. You know, and, and because we see it, we want, we want our fellow commissioners to see it. And thanks for the update. Thank I'll you. Make a comment. Um, first off, I want to apologize for not being able to be there. I had to uh, herd about 27 doctors, and so I would much rather have been with y'all. <laughs> I think it would have been a lot more fun, yes, but you know how it is. So maybe the next year it'll be I can come yes. to another of your activities. So keep sending out invites to your stuff. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I, I want to recognize that although she's hiding in the audience, um, Ms. Myers was in attendance also on Saturday for Law Day um, in the attorney segment. So yes, thank her for her service as well. I just had a couple questions. <clears throat> the first one is roughly how many members are at the YMCA? 757 membership unit. 757? Uh, 
657 membership units. So okay. depending on family size, that's like 2,000 or so. Okay. People. Okay. Okay, about 2,000. And then my other question is for people who may be watching um, in, in UG World or for the small amount of people that are here, how we appreciate a lot of stuff you guys spoke about, but how do they find out, one, how to get engaged with those programs, and two, the, to the scheduling of those events and programs? Um, well, we have our website, KansasCityYMCA.org, that's always updated with all of our events and calendars. Um, also, our Facebook page, we update that regularly as well. So those are the fastest ways in which to um, find out about this information. We also do school drops um, with flyers of our of the children, the youth events that we have as well. So those um, oftentimes if, go home in backpacks. And we're located at 900 North 8th Street. Um, I know the new year is coming up, so everyone has a new year's resolution. And hopefully um, we have a lot of promotions that's coming up that will hopefully uh, support whatever your goals are. So please come support us. This item does not require any action. If there are no other questions, we will thank Mr. Henderson and his team for their presentation. Other than just a big thank you for all your hard community work. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you very much. Your time. Yes, thank you. See you tomorrow. Right. <laughs> <laughs> 5.30. <laughs> <laughs> and that does conclude our committee agenda and takes us to the public agenda. We did have a public appearance request from Dave and Joan Sparrow regarding mail delivery. If you'll come to the microphone right there next to you, the um, podium stand, state your name and address for the record, and you'll be given three minutes to make your presentation. We just make sure we get one copy around to the clerk. My name is Dave Spiro. I live at 5017 Crest Drive, Kansas City, Kansas, 66106. My name is Joan Spiro. I also live at 5017 Crest Drive. Uh, Kansas City, Kansas. We've lived there 60 years, so you can call us Dotties. <laughs> okay, you pass out those forms. Yes. Uh, this, the reason we're here is this is something that happened in August, and uh, Commissioner uh, Brian McKiernan is aware because his incident was first and ours was a few days after. What we're here is to let you know that uh, one of the reasons that we spoke to Brian was uh, hoping that we could go uh, before the mayor and all of you, uh, of the, uh, the commissioners, because we wanted you to know that the rights of your constituents were being abused. Number one, our three key points are the rights of your commissioners on door-to-door -door delivery. Number two is their safety and health. Number three is the theft from cluster box break-ins. And uh, to begin with, What you have just been handed is customer rights when the Postal Service solicits to change the mode of mail delivery. And this happens to be found in Section 631.6 .6 of the POM, which is the Postal Operations Manual. And this section is uh, printed on the second page of this document. And you'll notice it says customer signatures must be obtained prior to a conversion of the mode of mail delivery. And whether the residents are and lots are owned, property owners must agree to this conversion in writing. And those who do not agree must be allowed to retain their current mode of delivery. Well, you can look at the further part of it. This is a copy of a letter that was sent to each one of the carriers in Highland Crest. And I'm not sure that's what was sent out to the ones in, not in uh, the central or the cathedral area. And on the one, two, three, fourth paragraph, it states, on August the 11th, 2014, a letter carrier was attacked by a dog while delivering mail. That's only partially right, because I have a letter from the carrier. And it says, our plan is to change from mail receptacles located on the homes to a neighborhood delivery and collection box, which is called a cluster box, in a central location of this block. It's at the top of a hill, which is not a central location. This is a picture of the cluster box. And at the bottom, it shows 
this is the curb right here. So you will stand in the street to get in the box to get your mail, which is a safety factor. This is a copy. It's not very good, but it's our diagram. We're not ours. It's a diagram of all the homes. There's 28 homes that are being affected by this. There's one side, the other side, and down on the block, bottom of the block. Not only that, this is the bottom. This is a steep hill that you have to go up. And many of the people in these homes are seniors, elderly people. <coughs> One man just had his foot amputated. That's safety and health. Then I have material from Congressman Yoder. We have been working with Susan for a long time, Susan Metzger, who does a lot of the legislation for Kevin. And it shows in here, first, he tried to call people, I think, from the cathedral area and from the Highland Crest area would call to speak to the postmaster to find out why, what's going on, why are we being punished. So then, Congressman Yoder tried to get a hold of the postmaster. He would not return the congressman's calls. He sent a letter. He would not return the, the uh, or even call or receive the letter or do anything about it. So Kevin Yoder had to send a letter to the Postmaster General. And in here, the one paragraph, I urge you to restore traditional delivery service to the homes of the Cathedral neighborhood and the Highland Crest neighborhood in Kansas City, Kansas, as well as look into whether or not proper procedures were used when making this decision. In addition, I urge you instruct your local postal officials to meet with the neighborhoods and establish good dialogue in order to restore the confidence of these communities and the United States Postal Service. On August 26th, a letter in response to the Honorable Kevin Yoder saying, and I will go to paragraph four, on August 11th, 2014, a mail carrier was attacked by two dogs while delivering mail in the Highland Crest neighborhood, South 51st Terrace. One of the attacking dogs bit the letter carrier, causing injury and medical attention. It did not break the skin. What happened was, she has a dog, it's a female carrier, she has a dog that walks the neighborhood with her. And this dog that came over the fence was in a kennel, somehow the lock was broken or something and it came flying over the fence at her. The dog that walks with her got between her and the dog. She kicked the dog first. And then the dog that walks with her got between her and the other dog and kept that dog from harming her. And she said, she told them about it. And she went after uh, it was over, she went to the doctor just to have it looked at. The doctor put a Band-Aid on her leg. She lost no time and she was back to work the next day. So as I said, 20, here we have a letter from her which I'm going to read. Ms. Farrow, to let's not read that letter. I, th I haven't been timing, but I think we're over time, so if you just wrap up your comments. Okay. Um, you stated well, for the record like, what the situation yes, was. What we so. would like you to do, we would like e the mayor and each of you, the commissioners, to let your constituents know what their rights are, because these people had no idea what their rights were not at all what they could do and you see what their rights are in those sheets you have and that's what we're asking you to do. make them aware of what their rights are this is wrong I, I, I understand that uh, Brian uh, went to his churches and the area places where they had groups and gave, put out the word to neighborhood groups yes, yes neighborhood yes. groups and we're asking you to do the same thing. Alert your groups, alert, alert your neighborhoods that they cannot put cluster boxes in unless the people sign it. Written Everybody on the block has to sign it. That's right. If one person doesn't sign it, nobody, it. no cluster boxes. Did a copy of this 
make it around to the clerk. Great. Thank you guys for your comments. Thank you okay, much. thank you. For Do you have any questions? No, I think we have a pretty good idea of what you're talking about. <laughs> well, and I have uh, cluster boxes down by my yeah. where I, I am, and I you know, know exactly what you're talking about. We were listening to everything that was going on with the dogs, and I would like to make a statement about that. We've always had dogs, and I don't care what kind of a dog you have. It is the owner's responsibility. But my problem that I wondered about is when there was about, uh, there's been no dog bites in our area for 20 to 25 years. But approximately maybe 30 years ago when my husband was still carrying mail, there was a real terrible bad dog thing came through the uh, screen door. And he just happened to be going back to his route and he had a spray and he got this dog off. So he went to, at the time, Mayor Jack Reardon, that's who the mayor was. He went up there and along with the codes violations, he had a leash law put on the books. And if the person, they would be fined if they didn't take care of their dog and if that dog was found out. Because so many of these people were talking about all the dogs that are running. Now, if there's a leash law, why isn't that leash law being used or being uh, enforced? Is there just not enough people for it or what? Good questions, but yes, I think that's the answer, not enough people. Yeah. Thanks for your comments, guys. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for having right. us. Thank yeah. you for Thank giving you. us the time. Um, on our outcomes, just we didn't talk about it last meeting, but staff is not prepared to come and present to us on our outcomes yet after our strategic planning, so we're just going to skip that for tonight, and we'll hear about it at later meetings. And that does conclude our meeting for this evening. Thanks to those in attendance. I wish I could run a short